initial research focus one, which is one of the research focuses of the collaboratory, and um, like all of complicated science, it's a bunch of people involved. Um, I listed Larry Corey and David Rawlings and myself, but there's a whole team of people that are doing the coordinating all this. So, as you said, a big collaboration between between all institutions, but but lots of people as well. Right. So the focus of our research is trying to make what we call HIV resistant and HIV card cells. And it's complicated, so I will try to explain. It's kind of, I think the science is pretty cool. It's exciting technology, but it's also a little complicated. Um, so I tried to focus a little actually more on the background and the rationale for why we're, why we're interested in doing um, I don't remind you guys if this, this is why here. I'm going to bother. Um, <laughs> this point is to you know to remind people that, that, that um, which we sort of forget sometimes that, that, that yes, there's this is big group of people live with HIV, but there's there's morbidity. There's there's there are a lot of um, complications, and they're maybe not as life threatening as, as they were before the antiretroviral therapy. But there are more complications than than you would like. That's for sure. And the drugs get better, but but there's still there's uh, still more malignancies in cancer. There's still more heart disease. There's um, still more concerns about neurocognitive ability and things like that. And when I talk to people, a lot of people say, "Why are you doing this risky, expensive new therapy?" Um, for HIV when we have these great one-pill, once-a-day drug drugs. And I think it's not so simple. And the people, that's the, the right answer. And for other people, um, maybe that's the right answer. And we'll come back to that about who who really was it in this kind of high therapy and who wouldn't. And, and, and you guys can certainly help us think about that better. Um, so um, what I was studying really basic HIV research, which, and the question was, how does HIV persist? And especially once we have good therapy, why does virus just go away? Um, why don't all the infected cells die? And there were a bunch of theories. Yeah, the drugs work pretty well, but there's a few viruses that infect new cells. Sorry for that, but HIV and the <laughs> So, um, what is CAR T cells? Um, 
this is a UN aid um, car, um, but it's not what we're going for. Um, it's cute, but it's not what we're going for. Um, so these stories are all from 2002, 2013, 14, was when these car T cells burst onto the field. CAR stands for Chimeric Antigen Receptor. Let's explain a little bit more um, as we go along. And this was an idea that um, I started in Israel maybe 25 years ago. People have been chipping away at it and, and perfecting the technology, and they made some key advances, which, you know, 25 years later, they really had huge success in um, in cancer, not in a bee, in cancer. So if, if we have Timothy Ray Brown, this is Emily Whitehead, who was this little girl who had an untreatable leukemia, had failed multiple types of therapy for leukemia. Um, she was the first child to get CAR T cell therapy, and in a week or two, her cancer was gone, and is alive today, sort of touting the benefits of, of CAR T cell therapy uh, for cancer. And there were some adults that were treated at the same time, and it was equally successful. And so this is. Um, this is Science Magazine saying that this type of cancer immunotherapy was the breakthrough of the year in 2013, and all of a sudden there was a lot in the regular newspapers and magazines about it. This is a little picture about how it works um, from Forbes. This is a New York Times article about Emily Whitehead and her family, and there was a lot of press about this. It so happened that um, Seattle is one of the hotbeds of this type of therapy. It was something that um, one of the researchers at Children's had been working on for a while, and, uh, as well as some of the researchers at the French. And so it just happened to be in a place where this, this was really actively going on. The kids at the Children's Hospital where I work um, were, were getting treated with this kind of therapy, and I said, huh, I want we can take this and rather than treat cancer cells, can we kill off the HIV infection? So my simple schematic of, of the general idea of how it works. So there's a person who, is, I have HIV, but, but um, for sure it works the same way. You take cells from that person. So here's my little drawing of a, you know, 10 cells. You collect a, a good number of cells, and then you make some modifications to those cells so that they recognize in HIV, but in cancer, in the case that they recognize cancer. And so you make that modification, so all of a sudden these are immune cells who are they're used to recognizing viruses and things like that, but you program them to recognize what you want. And and then in the lab, you grow a big batch of these. I don't know how many this is, but we get, sort of, you know, you start with one cell and you end up with 20 cells. So you have a big batch of these cells that you've designed to target cancer, or in our case, HIV. And then done that, that, that can take anywhere from a few to a couple of weeks to do part, um, and then you reintroduce those cells into the patient. We this is with people with HIV, but um, this is going on for cancer right now. You reintroduce them, and these cells seek out and kill the cancer cells. Um, this has been, as I mentioned, incredibly successful. Lots of good articles out there that that explain it in that are understandable, but without dumbing it down. For the New York Times did a whole series. This is a guy named Tom Rosenberg who works at the NIH. He's been on this for years. Um, and, uh, but they had about six articles, big articles in the New York Times about how, how CAR T-cell therapy works. If you, if you want sort of a simple explanation, so here's their pictures explaining what regular T-cell is, what, um, and, then, and then how they engineer these T-cells by introducing these new make a T cell, and then the T cell they've engineered goes and kills the target. Um, there's also some great videos. Um, you even try that link. You can try that. Um, I think one from the AP that. Um, uh, oh, it's not hyperlink. Um, try it. It's, it's, it's not too complicated. I think it helped me explain the concept, and this was, um, if I said the 
right link. This is the link. The Associate Press, to try to explain CAR T cell therapy, made a uh, made video. You need to this body Medical poetic stem cell transplants. 
they've already failed bone marrow transplant. So this group of patients is a, they still have a 25% chance of living for the next six months. By the time they've exhausted these therapies and um, failed bone marrow transplant, um, the prognosis is quite poor. And so they've been able to um, they've been able to get survival rates rather than 20% in the 70%, some of the 80, 90% depending on which trial you look at. And, um, but this, these numbers for this type of cancer have, have borne out in multiple hospitals now, multiple trials now. So, so uh, for people that were basically dying of this type of cancer, this was, this was literally life changing. And um, so this is what got people so enthusiastic about this type of therapy um, and, um, and um, what got excited about trying to do this for HIV. This has had a lot of commercial success as well. So these are just news things about when the FDA approved the first two. So two of these therapies are now approved for, for different types of cancer, these CD19 positive cancers. And both of those led to a big commercial transaction. I forget which one goes with which, but, but uh, Gilead, the biggest HIV company in the world, a company called Kite who was doing this. And the guy, the picture I showed earlier, Dr. Rosenberg, that was the company he started. And that company was purchased for a lot of money. And then so this was a local company that we've been working with called Juno Therapeutics. They were also bought recently by a big bio company called Celgene, which is not a traditional HIV company, but they're um, really excited right now about sort of cutting edge new biotechnology. And so the two fruit drugs, actually this one isn't approved yet. So this one approved, and um, Vardis, working with the University of Pennsylvania, has an approved drug. Um, so, uh, and people expect the Juno drug to get approved. So a lot of money is now chasing this idea, and people are pretty excited about it, and it's borne out. It's not just medical patients. It's a lot of patients, and enough data that the FDA um, approved two of these drugs so far. So, CAR T cells are not... But um, they're uh, common to make. They involve um, genetic engineering, which is um, uh, has some risks that we don't maybe fully understand. Um, we're learning a lot, um, and uh, but they they can cause problems. So it's not like they cure 90 percent of people without any toxicity. So I think it's only fair in a discussion about CAR T cell therapy to talk about the toxicity. So somebody asked about sarcoma. They have trouble with the get 
get high fever, they get chills, they get shakes, and as families in the hospital are all excited when it happens. They're like, oh, look, they're working. And it, it actually is a, it, it is associated with the cell working and doing their job that they've engineered them to do. Just your immune response to the flu, this is an immune response to cancer. It's been engineered, but it's the same kind of response. And so um, a lot of the families right now at Children's have come from all over the world to get this kind of therapy in their the family are all excited, almost giddy when they start to get sick, and you're like, that's kind of weird, but um, but because they know that these cells are working. In two cases, so they, they call that the cytokine release syndrome. So these cells are really revved up. They're killing a lot of cells. It's very inflammatory, and so the term for it that has people to use is cytokine release syndrome. And the problem is that in really extreme cases, there have been deaths. And um, and so if your chance of dying in the next, you know if, if, if your chance of dying in the next six months is eighty percent, if a patient out of two hundred dies because of the therapy, those are sort of chances people are willing to take. Um, they're probably not willing chances people are willing to take if they're on um, one pill one day for HIV. So no um, that the exact same specifics would hold with HIV, uh, but, but I think. Immediately went 
away and she started getting better. She didn't have the brain, the, the, the brain problem, but she did have all these fears and chills and they were scared. And so I think they did give her the, the IL-6 inhibitor. Um, and so they're now, the protocols are much more specific about exactly when to get the IL-6 inhibitor. Um, they, there's concern that you want to let these T cells do their thing and go kill all the cancer. And you've spent time and effort to make these cells. You don't want to sort of hold them back and not miss the chance of curing the cancer. So they, they, they're working hard to figure out what's the right balance there. Um, all, all these T cells that are going in, CAR T cells that are going into patients now have a so-called kill switch. Um, so they can be um, in kill. They, um, different companies do it in different ways, but basically they have a molecule that they express on their service. They engineer that way so that if they have to, they can give a FDA-approved drug that will get that and should kill them. And so it's barely actually been used in clinical practice, so we don't know how well that will work, but it's been engineered with that in mind. Um, so theoretically, that's what should happen. Um, so I, I think they're cool, they're exciting, but there's some there's potential risk. Um, so we like talking about why we think they might be good for HIV. Turns out, uh, I'll get to this, I guess it's the last point here. They actually the only randomized controlled trial of CAR T cells was for HIV in the um, 80s, early 90s, early 90s in San Francisco, a company called Cell Genesis. Um, and uh, I'll come back to that on the next slide. Um, so it's an idea that's been around for a while that this strategy might work for HIV. Um, so one criticism is that if the virus is totally asleep, the these cells won't work. It can't organize a cell where the virus is totally asleep, totally latent, making any molecules that can be targeted. Uh, but it turns out that when you look carefully, in almost everybody, there's some virus being expressed it isn't replicating, but the cells continue to make a little bit of virus. That's why if you take away antivirals, the virus comes back in a couple of weeks, just like an initial infection, because there's virus being made, and the drugs are stopping it from replicating. And so if the virus is going to replicate and come back, then there's viral proteins on the surface that we think we can target. And one of the things, one of the things we think is really attractive about these CAR T cells is that the virus is actually evolve ways to evade the immune system. It dates really quickly. So killer T cells stop after a few months. They don't recognize the virus. The virus as it's replicating makes mutations and it it basically finds um, combinations that the host's immune system can't recognize. And so this these part T cells, the way they're engineered, can get around that problem. It also does things to hide itself from the immune system. So it regulates these MHC molecules, which are normally what present the foreign proteins to the immune system, and it shuts those down. And so we think um, we think that these CAR T cells are attractive because they can get around that. The other attractive about them is that they it's a one-time therapy in theory, but that when you've made these CAR T cells, as they showed in that video, they can keep dividing and replicating. And so in theory, they will have a long-term therapeutic benefit with what we would want um, if you to the point where you were going to treat one with these CAR T cells and take away therapy, take away CRT, you'd want these CAR T cells to live a long time and be there and be ready to kill H infected cells. So for all those reasons, we think these T cells really have potential for HIV. And just remind people, because people in the CAR T cell field have sort of forgot about it, there were these trials um, of CAR T cells for AB. These were people that were on therapy, but by modern standards back in the late 90s, wouldn't be considered to be on high of therapy, but they were on therapy. And they, the outcome they cared about was blips, how many viral blips these patients were having. And they, they sort of had a trend to reducing the number of blips in the blood, uh, but it it was a small study. It was randomized. I think 20 people in each arm, um, but it wasn't uh, wasn't a big enough study to show that they had really reduced the number of flips. And I think based on that, since that was their primary income, they sort of stopped the um, 
company stopped pursuing this strategy. They made out of money. But, but when they looked at some other parameters, so this is how much HIV could they grow from the patient's cells. They actually reduced the amount of virus they could grow from the patient's cells by about 50%. And the random control study, and it was statistically significant. But despite that, this didn't really go anywhere. It's helpful in that they, the FDA actually asked them to follow these patients for 10 years to see if they had any side effects. So they followed five patient years or more. Now, it's, it's definitely missed now. They've, um, so they followed this group of 40 or so patients um, 10 to now 15 years and not seeing any major toxicity. And then these graphs show that they can actually still detect these genetic engineered CAR T cells in the peripheral blood. This is sort of data together from three separate studies. That's why it's three separate graphs. But the point being, they're, they're rare, but they can still detect these CAR T cells all these years later, up to 10 years, up 10 years, 10 years plus in some patients. They're still able to detect these CAR T cells. Really can, if you do it right, they live a long time. So now we're in, so that's the background of the rationale. I'll veer a little bit into the science. Speak up or slow down. Um, but um, my name is Jeff Hoffman. I'm from Harvard Medical School. I have a question about the uh, Medicare Part of the state. No, so interesting. They, they tried Cardell. The study was published in 2002, but those studies were sort of late 90s. They, um, there was intentional treatment interruption. These were people, by modern standards, weren't fully suppressed. So they were having little blips from time to time using the old cutoff of 400 or 100, I can't remember, but it, um, in that study. And, um, so these are people that may have had a little resistance. For whatever reason, they were continuing to have blips of 500, and they wanted to see... They, they, they didn't stop therapy at all, and the idea was to see if these CAR T cells would get them from blips to no blips, literally what they wanted. That was their primary end they were shooting for. Nothing else, people who don't engage I'd love to talk to you guys about that, because I think um, the moonshot is to completely cure HIV and, and not any toxicity, but that's a moonshot. I think for far low, but, but, but where more potential is to come up with a therapy that may provide some benefit for a prolonged period of time at one time therapy. And who would, who would benefit from that? And, and I think you guys may know better than I would, but I, I think that's a bigger population than, uh, or it's, at least it's an understudied population in this country, because to be honest, it's a hard population to study. The people that are, uh, for one reason or another, not on therapy, um, but would, would entertain doing a high-risk study, and you felt like you could get enough follow-up to make it worthwhile. So it's a, it's a, it's tricky, but it's not a reason I don't think to not consider studying that group of patients. And you know what numbers you look at? I don't know if it's a third of people in this country with HIV know the HIV and not on therapy. I mean, it's a pretty significant chunk of the HIV-infected population. And would some of these people benefit from this? I think I think that actually where something like this may, I mean, I'm, I'm I, you know, I'm speculating, I, you know, but but somewhere where we've thought about could could it have benefit in that group? Yeah, I mean, especially if somebody's already like somewhat perhaps, you know, like some people who are like naturally not to not happen. Right. Oh, and I, I actually I have some questions at the end, sort of guys about you know who 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 should we even we're we're not to the point of doing a clinical trial right now. I jump ahead and say Penn is ramping up to do a clinical trial of this technology, um, and we wanted to refine it more in in. Um, primates, which was really the focus of what we're doing in the collaboratory, um, but um, we're studying in mice and trying to really refine our approach. Um, Penn was a little bit ahead of us with some of the technology. They had worked with SEMO for years and, and sort of were, were pushing ahead and, and getting ready to do a clinical trial. Um, so, um, uh, and, and 
from a logical reason, it's easier to study people who are on really reliable. They want to do every study. They're on their treatment. You know, that's an easier group to study, but, but not maybe the population that would benefit from them. Where are going from? I don't want to too deep into the... Um, for those of you who really want to think about how this works, um, this little schematic. Um, so the blue in this case, this blue is sort of a cutaway of a big blue cell, if you imagine that. And um, that's a CAR T cell. And what we see here is this little receptor. And if we take an antibody that recognizes HIV, and then that links to the molecules that normally trigger the T cells to attack infected cells. So um, it's not an antibody that someone's stuck in here. It's, it's called a cell receptor that recognizes a foreign protein and tells the cell, oh, yeah, you should proliferate and excrete these toxins that kill. And so this sort of ends to be an HIV-infected cell in our case. So we've sort of engineered the immune system, if you will, to recognize HIV and trace response, which should kill the um, infected cell. Um, and this little orange brown box is really what made CAR T cell work. So um, if you want to get into the science, they tried this sort of this green part for years, and it was only when they added this brown part, and that's what all the you know, probably lawyers are fighting about with these big companies, and that's what really made CAR T cell work. You had to have this so-called co-stimulatory domain, and they talked about second-generation cars. It was really these second-generation cars that worked, that had this built-in co but they think we have a unique problem, and that is that HIV can infect the cells that we're engineering. So we them to go kill HIV, but part of HIV, the way HIV evades the immune response is just to infect and kill the cells that are responding to it. So we um, took advantage of some of the technology that's out there to, to disrupt the co-receptor, C5, as a way to protect our CAR T cells from getting infected. I'm one, but so I can So this batch of cells, what we're envisioning is you take cells from the patient and you engineer in this receptor, which is the part that recognizes HIV and directs the cell to sort of program the cell to kill an HIV-infected cell. But at the same time that we're doing that, we're also disrupting with an enzyme the receptor. So we are making these people like Delta-32, homozygous, CCR5 uh, is the idea. And when they eventually, like... Probably not. Our hope is that we can get a stable population of cells that will kill HIV infected cells and can't be killed off by HIV. We're, we're not aiming in these experiments to sort of turn the whole immune system into a resi HIV resistant immune system with, with stem cell transplants. We were hoping not to have to do a stem cell transplant, but that you could infuse these smaller enough cells in that would see HIV, they would proliferate and be around to get HIV infected cells and couldn't be by HIV, is the idea. Yeah, I haven't studied that because it's, it's as a totally preventative measure, it's, it's, it's sort of it and gene therapy and all that, so it's unrealistic that you're going to use that as a perfect strategy, and um, at least initially. So we've been focusing on treatment rather than prevention. But in theory, you might be able to use these for prevention as well. Um, so this was just to point out that what we did was all these people have spent billions of dollars trying to make vaccines. So they understand this HIV molecule on the surface of the cells really well. And we basically leveraged that and took these antibodies that people have spent years describing and stuck them into our car construct. And other that HIV mutates really quickly, so we picked a couple that target different spots on the HIV envelope to try to prevent them from, again, mutating to become resistant to our therapy. Uh, we talked about this. I don't think I need to really dwell on this. This is too much science, 
but um, it's okay. It's okay. But other groups, not us, um, mold other groups now, there's others. Basically, this is, if you would, it shows that these engineered T cells can get infected by HIV. So basically, these little dots out here are HIV infected CAR cells. Um, and so, multiple now have shown that this is a real problem. But if you hear these cells, great, they'll rush in, find the infected cells, all revved up, but in the process, they can get infected by HIV. Uh, there's also different ways to disrupt CCR5. That's the same way. There's a whole bunch of other technologies, and we're dabbling in all sorts of them. But this technology has really come a long way. It's really um, more efficient than it needs to be to get in and disrupt the co-receptor for HIV. It's protecting the cells from infection as well. But we, we started with one called a mega tau, um, which is, you don't need that, but it's a whole <laughs> of different uh, technologies that you can use. Strategies, these cell and gene therapy cure strategies in prank in, in monkeys. And so we actually had to reverse engineer a lot of what we were doing in human cells to work in um, monkey cells. So we spent a year figuring out how to what we had done in, in human cells and do it in monkey cells. Again, a little cartoon, but so we have this cell, and basically we have to put in a new gene, and we use virus to put in a new gene. Um, and then we have to get this enzyme in that will knock out that CCR5 receptor. So this process um, is not super efficient. And so we have to learn how to do it in human cells. We had to figure out, go back and figure out how to do it in, in primate cells. So all this work in the lab that's sort of technical, but basically we have cells that have HIV, cells that have HIV, and we actually label them with different fluorescent colors. And that are CAR T cells that have a different fluorescent color. And we look specifically to say, oh, look, do all the HIV-infected cells go away? We don't kill any of these uninfected cells. You know, check of our, our these CAR T cells we've engineered and really look to see, and that's what this map is showing, that these green cells in this experiment way when we added CAR T cells. So this is part of the in vitro, type of in vitro data in the lab that we had showing we could make these and, and that, that they worked. Um, So this experiment is measuring the amount of virus in a test tube. So if you take, um, in this case, the genes that aren't engineered to, to fight HIV, HIV replicates pretty well in the test tube. So after a couple days, you get a lot of virus in the test tube. If you engineer CAR T cells, we get a pretty nice drop in the amount of virus in the test tube. And if we also knock out CCR5, that co-receptor, get even more reduction in the amount of virus. So the virus is going down. Yeah. Whereas if you don't knock out CCR5, it sort of creeps back up over time. We really think you need to do both things. It's clear and change for the pre So which one? Uh, the pre and the pre Yeah, we, had, we, at the time that we wrote the the, for the for the current version of the collaboratory, at that point we had done it all in the lab, all in all in the lab. So so yeah so I had um, so I was focusing on this in the lab and I actually wrote a grant to um, it was they had two focuses one was to optimize this technology get it working better and test it in mice. And so I'm still working on that, doing some experiments in these so-called humanized mice. Um, and then because of this data and because our focus right data was already on cell and gene therapy strategies and the, there's a lot of interest in these CAR T cells, we can jump ahead and try it in the, in the primate model that they had developed. So now, let's talk the engineering CAR T cells. Every 
we're doing is so-called autologous, meaning it's your own auto cell. So we're taking cells out of one monkey, entering them, and giving them back to the same monkey. So there are groups that have said, oh, well, this works great. Wouldn't it be even better if you didn't have to, you could just have a whole bank of these cells? So there are groups, we're not working on this right now, but there are groups that are doing that, trying to engineer them so that you give them to anybody. And it wouldn't have to be this sort of very complicated process where a patient has to come in, donate blood, wait a couple weeks while they make it, and read it. It could just be like, oh, you have cancer, come in, and we'll give you some cells. And so the few patients have been treated like that, the so-called London baby, but um, that's sort of cutting edge. So everything about it is with cells. So you're one of the patients that are with the cells that That is a really good question, um, and we don't know the answer yet. We sort of envisioned it in combination with some latency reversing agents. Um, it out everybody on therapy, even the best therapy, well, the single best therapy, the average patient has one, two copies of virus per milliliter of blood. So, so we call it effective antiretroviral therapy, but there's actually a lot of virus that's still being produced. So our attitude was, well, let's go try to get rid of that first and um, not worry about reactivating it. Let's just go kill the cells that are making virus right now, that little bit of virus. And those are probably not in the peripheral blood. They're probably in your lymph nodes and your gut. And, play that. and so our idea was just with people that were on therapy and see if you can get rid of those residual cells that are still making virus, which isn't the really, really latent cells. And we, if it works, then it works, then we'll, you know, try combining it with other A great question. And our hope was that they would live for, like in that other study, so when the cells do come out of latency, they would still dare and be able to kill them. So you could kill them right away. You, you, they, you could actually put them in and let them wait and, you know, wait until HIV comes out of latency. You don't need to see that. So we, we've published the, some of the in vitro stuff. Um, so this is now to talk about what we're really doing in the, in the IRF, the Initial Research Focus 1 of the, the laboratory. Um, the actual aims that we, we put into the grant, so we were going to optimize production and the phenotype of these protected anti-HIV CAR T cells. Um, and we, we talk about screening their activity in small animal models. We've struggled with the best model to test these. They're complicated. They're not like an old-fashioned drug where you have a very specific molecule and you can um, produce it and test it. You're, you're, it's, it's a living drug. You've got to sort of grow it and feed it. And, and um, on certain days, it does better than others. And it's, um, it's complicated. It's, it, it ends up being a population of cells, and they all behave a little differently. And so we've struggled with what's the best or simple animal model to really predict what best product um, to use. And that's something that the whole field of CAR T cells is struggling with. Um, and um, we are doing some where we just basically take a bunch of cells from somebody who has HIV and see in the lab. We make these cells with their, you know, make CAR T cells from the patient and then take another alpha of cells from that same patient and get rid of the HIV-infected cells. So we hadn't done it that way. So that was one of the sort of technical aims. Um, and then the real first aim in the, in the primary, which was the big focus, really, is to look at do these cells engraft, do they trend, do they proliferate, and do they persist in, um, in monkeys that are untreated with a shiv infection. So we didn't actually care about the viral load at first. These are not on treatment. We just want to see, can we make the cells? And we give them to the monkey. Do they survive? Do they proliferate? How long do they last? Where do they go in the body? And that's really what we wanted to address at first. And if you wait, the grant was set up, we had up some short-term goals, and then there was um, longer-term goals in years three, four, and five of the grant. And so the idea was if it worked well, then we would try it in, in 13 
treated uh, animals, which is a little bit more of a challenge. Like you said, there's less HIV around for these cells to target, and it takes longer because you got to put them on therapy, and it's more expensive. So we said, start with these. If it works, we'll go on to these. So I don't, um, I don't. It's taken a lot of work on our part to. Um, all these cells were like a little biotech company. We have to make um, tons of reagents, and the, the, to do the gene engineering, you have to make viruses that have the gene you want, and make the cells with these viruses. So we've, we've done a lot of work. Um, this is just sort of gives you a sense of the timing, really, is that we they have animals, animals get infected for for some basically, and then, um, and then we treat with these CAR T cells, and we want them for Basically, uh, just to see what happens to the CAR T cells, and that was really the focus um, in the first year of the grant. Um, and well, the budget kept getting revised. Um, um, so, so when when we when it, uh, so yeah, this, this number is a little. This was for the first two years of the grant. We were supposed to have 20 animals. So we did six animals in the first year of the grant. Yeah. And then we're, we're starting another batch of about eight animals. So instead of 20, um, uh, well, that's the revised down number was 20. And so now really it's sort of 14. It shows these experiments are very expensive and labor intensive. So we basically had an animal that got no cardi cells. Um, or actually, two animals that got no CAR T cells, they got cells, but they didn't have this engineered thing to attack HIV. Mm -hmm. And we have four animals that got treated with the CAR T cells. And um, one animal, they, um, they did a necropsy at two weeks. And the other three animals, they did a biopsy and the necropsy at six weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, see if I can. This is not going to care about it all, but we were pretty excited that we were actually able to make the cells, which is a technical challenge. So, so this is, you know, how much of the CDR5 gene did we disrupt? Any um, of the cells were expressing, we can measure in the lab, how many of the cells are expressing the, the CAR. And so we get high levels of, expression of this, this we put in. And then look at how many cells we were able to make. And so you know, we wanted to take cell dose, and how much can we expand the cells in the lab? So that was all pretty successful. We were very happy about that. Uh, it hadn't really been done much in primates, and so we were we were happy we were able to success make a lot of cells. Uh, and we're in the process of analyzing a lot of data from those first animals. But the question we're interested in is, do they do they survive? And even before we look at do they work or do anything, we just want to know do they do they survive? If they'll die in the first day, they're probably not going to do anything. So in this top we're looking at one group of cells, CD4 cells at the bottom, we're looking at CD3 cells, that's not as important. The dots out to the right are CAR-T cells. So we can know what percentage of the cells in the, this is bone marrow and spleen, what percentage of the cells um, express the CAR-T cell. And we measure this little marker, but, so we definitely see, and this was from a necropsy at six weeks, we definitely see some of our engineered cells, um, with many in the CD4s, definitely some in the CD8, that I for six weeks in, in these monkeys, and um, at least in these sites, we can find some. So we were excited to see that. These numbers, we weren't excited about these numbers, but these numbers were about as good as we could have expected. Um, and so we were asked to summarize what we did in the first year. It was really, we were excited that we were able to engineer this product and that we were able to detect cells. It, the cells are there at pretty low levels in a lot of the tissues, so it's technically challenging to measure how many of these cells are there. Um, so um, that's what we're actually still working on before we can sort of make a definitive summary of this first group of six animals, is to sort of quantify how many cells survive. Um, and then we're moving on to a more complicated experiment in year two. Um, which is we're going to test different cars at once and have two different reporter genes. And we're going to have a C46 approach rather than the CCR5 approach to protect the car T cells from infection. 
we'll go a few animals that way, and we'll go a few animals that way. This is a different technology. Rather than disrupting the co-receptor, C46 is the co anti-fusion molecule. So if you express this at the surface of the cell, HIV can't infect the cell. This is a, an approach that a company called Calimune was working on in, in California, and they had collaborated with the, the, the consideration of the collaboratory. And so Hans Peter and, and uh, Chris Peterson had this experience with C46, and they, you know, the thing about it is that it, it doesn't just target the, the um, CCR5 viruses, but it targets the CCR4 viruses and the CCR5 viruses. And the CCR5 biology is a little complicated and maybe different between monkeys and humans. And this gets away from a lot of that. And we're also at a few animals where we put them briefly on their teeth, really just to reduce the amount of virus around before we give the CAR T cell. We're worried that there's so much virus around in these untreated animals that it was potentially infecting and ending a lot of the CAR T cells. Because this really on ART is the narrow most people would imagine you would start with in a clinical trial. Um, at least the first group of the next group of eight animals, uh, two control animals, and three and treated these two different ways. Um, and we're we're gearing up uh, to do those experiments. We already have those. Um, so just we are animals, and we're going to start soon. This slide is just to point out. It takes a ton of people to do these experiments. Like cells are going back and forth between Fred and Seattle Children's and Yub and the Primate Center, and it. it logistically complicated to do all this, and there's a lot of people involved that um, I really didn't do this on my own. This requires a whole team. So it's a little, little feel, feel around here. I don't know if they're going to Burning Man or where they're going with this thing, but you can see this is sort of an armored car. They've got some protection, so it won't get back to man kill themselves. I don't know. I think we need to make some progress to find this a bit, and that's really what we're focusing on. But um, so um, uh, rather than end with a lot of people to thank, I was going to end with with sort of questions for you guys. And so in our mind, the novel, exciting, the whole class of therapy, the world is learning a lot about it, but it's potentially high risk. Um, you and this affiliated company in, um, in Philadelphia are planning a clinical trial. Are really focused on refining the product in, in animals, and these are sort of the questions for the, the community, which is, is, what do you have for therapy in general? You, you know, there's a few. Is that enough to sort of kill the whole idea? And how much data are we going to need um, before we can sort of justify a small clinical trial? Who would participate in a trial like that? Um, are individuals that, despite knowing there's some risk, would want to participate? Um, and um, yeah, the group that we talked earlier with is for the people that um, are HIV positive. They know they're HIV positive, but they're not on ART for a lot of reasons. And would they be willing to participate in this? Um, and again, you know, you guys, I'm sure, have talked about all these differences, but there's the thought of a complete cure. I think the real estate best case scenario is we get a remission, which from a health standpoint is great, but psychologically it's different than a complete realizing cure. Um, you know, there's this sort of weight hanging over you that it could come back at any minute with those, you know, risks that are associated with that. And then, um, but it's even less effective than that, but it lowers the viral load, delayed optionistic infection. I think if you're ART doing well, that's no use to you, but if, if we would it help this group? Um, so we've spent some time starting to talk to Anne Collier in the, in the clinical course saying, and, you know, the, the doing a trial in, a, in that group of patients sort of gives you nightmares, but I don't know how much we've really explored it, that, that group of patients. We certainly, I, I see the kids that have HIV and children, and we certainly have, have some teachers that are infected. They know they're infected. They clinic once or twice a year and use to start treatment, and, uh, and they all have their own reasons, but uh, um, that a group that might be willing to participate in a trial like this, and should we put a little more effort in, into identifying who those people are and figuring out how would you do a trial. I mean, that's sort of an underserved group from a research. Because it's good to do research in that group. Versus, every day, you know, you know, that, you know, that, that group um, is the people that fight for all the studies. Um, 
And um, we're we're a long way from a from a phase three trial. I mean, we're, we're um, if we had some convincing data in monkeys, or maybe really convinced. There's a lot of debate about how useful the monkey model is. And if you had really amazing data in in, in mice, would you spend years trying to reproduce it in monkeys? And and there's been an effort away from using up a lot of monkeys. It really clear cut in, in, in mice. Our attitude was this was a new enough type of therapy and there were enough unknowns that to us made sense to try it in this prime model that we had available. But um, basically we have so far, we, we clearly need to refine it and get it working better. And um, but, but I think there's a lot of, of so many variables. That's, that's probably the hardest thing is you can control the number of cells, the type of cells, the gene you put in, how you protect them, um, you know, there's just so many variables and we can't, it's tough to split them all. And we have to sort of see them in combination a little bit and, and pick a combination we think and and, and, um, and then we'll pour over these, these monkey vaults and decide whether there's, whether they're working well enough to keep pursuing the strategy. So, I, you know, when you talk about how close are these things to a clinical work our strategy is a years away, at least from a from a clinical trial. Mm -hmm. sure. I um, would love to actually send the questions down to you all, because I would love to give you a chance to think and to come up with some answers. I would love to gather answers to them, at least to share with him, so he can hear us to see what you have to say about any of those. I don't think these questions are unique to, no. to CAR T cell therapy. I think they pertain to a lot of these cure concepts that are out there in our laboratory, other collaboratories. Yeah. Cool. Well, we are time, folks. Yeah. So I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank Bill for our Thanksgiving food here. Thank you. And Rishi Castro, I'm sure he's appreciated somewhere. <laughs>